Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's keynote webinar titled Interferons, Friends or Foes in Lung Virus Infections. This webinar is a part of the ninth annual event in the Microbiology Week virtual event series. I am Kaylee Bach of Labritz, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labritz. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you first to participate by communicating with other attendees using our live chat feature during the presentation. You can find the live chat located at the bottom left of your screen. You can also participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Help Desk button from the lobby within the event. And finally, as a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits image located on the right of your screen and follow the process to obtain your credits. All right, now let's get started. I'd like to present today's speaker, Ivan Zanoni, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital, Chair in the Field of Immunology at Harvard Medical School, Research Faculty, Division of Immunology, Division of Gastroenterology at Boston Children's Hospital. For a complete biography on our speaker, please find it on the left of your screen. Ivan, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, let me share my screen and let me go on presenter mode. So thank you very much for the nice introduction and I'm very happy to be virtually here today and to share with you some of our uh, uh, findings on the importance of interference uh, during uh, lung virus infections. So the immune system evolved to protect us against pathogens, but also to maintain homeostasis. And these two functions are fundamental for our survival. And they are, they are achieved thanks to the maintenance of a balance between immune resistance, that is the capacity of the immune system to fight an inv invading pathogen, and tissue repair, that is the capacity of the host and of the immune system to repair the tissue after the damage caused either by the pathogen itself or by the activation of the immune system itself. But based on genetic and or environmental factors or exposure to specific pathogen, this balance may be altered and this will lead to the development of inflammatory disorders and autoimmune. So fundamental to the maintenance of the balance are interference. And it is well known that uh, having uh, no interference is really bad, but also that having too much interference is also bad. What I will try to convince you, uh, hopefully today, is that it's not only a matter of quantity, but it's also really a matter of quality. So which interference are produced? where they are produced and when they are produced. That really matters to maintain this balance between immune resistance and tissue repair. So interference belong to three major families. Type one interference, very well known for their antiviral roles, and they are represented by a dozen interferon alpha, interferon beta, and other members of this family. Then there is a second family uh, called type 2 interference, and this is represented by interferon gamma, very well known for antibacterial functions, but also for antiviral functions. And finally, there is a third family of interference that was more recently described, and they've been called type 3 interference or interferon lambdas, and I will use both names during my presentation. This type 3 interference uh, are represented by four interferon lambdas, lambda 1, 2, 3, and 4 in humans, with interferon lambda 4 being a pseudogene in a large part of the population, while in mice there are only two of these uh, type 3 interferons, interferon lambda 2 and lambda 3. 
So the first story is really focused on, on uh, uh, the importance of type 1 and type 3 interference during uh, SARS-CoV-2 encounter. And why did we focus on these two families? Because as you, as you see, they are two different families. They are, they are structurally different. As you see, they use different receptors, the IFNAR for type 1 interference, the interferon lambda receptor for type 3 interference. But as you can see in this cartoon, the signaling cascade initiated by these two different families of interference is very similar and leads to the uh, activation of a transcription factor called ISGF3 that basically controls the induction of what we call antiviral interference stimulated genes or ISGs. These ISGs, these uh, interference stimulated genes, are very potent antivirals and they work as the fingerprint of the induction of either type 1 or type 3 interference. And although the two families are different, the set of ISGs that are induced either by type 1 or type 3 interference is very similar. And so in my lab, we have a strong interest in understanding why over evolution we maintained, uh, for example, the, the type 3 interference family when we have already dozens of type 1 interference. And so when the pandemic started now, a few years ago, uh, there were very little was known about the involvement of type 1 and or type 3 interference uh, in response to SARS-CoV-2 SARS encounter and in the development of COVID-19. Uh, so, and the, at the very beginning, there were a couple of big questions. And the first big question was, are interference produced upon SARS-CoV-2 encounter? And so a lot of uh, papers have been published, but what I am showing here is the one of the very first paper that really looked into uh, the induction of immune effectors upon SARS-CoV-2 encounter. Uh, and this is from Ben Tenover group, was published in Cell. And basically what this paper described is that upon COVID-2 encounter, there is a very potent induction in patients of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, while the production of interferons, and you see interferon beta, interferon lambda, so type 1 and type 3 interference, appear to be much restricted compared to other common respiratory viruses. And indeed, many groups uh, over the time, and this is just taken from a very nice uh, uh, review from uh, Stanley Perman uh, in Cell Austin Microbe, many groups showed that SARS-CoV-2 produces effectors that either inhibit the induction of interference or block the signaling of uh, downstream of the uh, receptor for the interference. And this explains probably why there is a, a lower induction of this interference by SARS-CoV-2. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, while uh, several groups showed uh, a reduction on, on the induction of interference, al other groups found a different uh, 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 response. And in particular, in this paper, and again, there are many of these, but this is one of the first, has been shown specifically looking in the lower airways of uh, uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, that uh, there is a very potent induction, not only of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but as you can see here also of ISGs, interferon-stimulated genes that, as I said, work as the fingerprint of the induction of the interference. And in this study, they compared COVID-19 patients with other patients that have a, a community-acquired pneumonia, either bacterial or viral, and they showed that the induction of these ISGs is much more potent in COVID-19 patients. So another big question uh, uh, beyond uh, are interference efficiently in use or not was are interference good or, or bad? And again, I'm just showing a couple of papers from uh, Jean-Laurent Casanova group. This group published many other papers, but actually many other groups also confirmed these uh, two initial science uh, uh, papers that really showed uh, that uh, genetic uh, uh, defects that prevent the production of interference or the response to interference or the, the existence of autoantibodies that block uh, the activity of interference are associated with severe COVID-19. And uh, 
uh, initially it, it was shown uh, that up to 10 15 percent of the severe COVID-19 patients have these uh, autoantibodies and or genetic defects but other papers show that this is to up to 20 25 percent of the most severe cases so these papers and many others support the idea that interferons are protective and when you do not produce them or you have antibodies that block their activity, you get uh, a severe COVID-19. Again, though, at the same time, other groups showed that it, uh, over time, uh, the severe COVID-19 patients are characterized by an over exuberant production of interferons or better of a, a very high level of interferon stimulated genes suggesting that over time or in specific cohort of patients interferons may also play detrimental roles and so the question were still quite open and part of this uh, was due to the fact that of course that cohort that are studied were different that in many cases, instead of looking at interferons themselves, uh, what was analyzed were, were the ISGs. Uh, and, uh, and so we really wanted to understand whether upon encounter with COVID-2, interferons were produced, which interferons were produced, and how these affect uh, disease severity. And so this is the work of three very talented people that at the time of the pandemic were in the lab. Some of these are still in the lab. Some left the lab to run their own uh, uh, lab. And the, all the data that I'm going to show you today have been uh, done using uh, uh, samples derived from patients that encounter the ancestral uh, COVID-2. We are now currently looking at how uh, new variants of concerns uh, uh, are affecting the induction of interference and the signaling in response to interference, but this is still ongoing. So I will just focus on the responses to the ancestral uh, SARS-CoV-2 that are very interesting from an immunological point of view because we were all basically naive to this virus. And so we could really understand by looking at samples and responses of uh, patients that encounter SARS-CoV-2 in the first wave how the immune system responds to the first encounter to a new RNA virus. And so this, this uh, project was uh, led in collaboration with Nicasio Mancini that at the time was at uh, uh, San Raffaele University. And we collected over 250 samples from ambulatorial subjects that were either positive or negative for SARS-CoV-2. And we could also uh, uh, diversify these uh, uh, these uh, subjects and patients, in patients that had a, a mild disease that were home isolated, in patients with a severe disease that were hospitalized, and in patients that had a critical disease that were isolated in the ICU. And what we really wanted to understand was uh, the landscape of interferon production along the, res the respiratory tract. And so we used the swabs to look at the upper airways, and we used the bronchial viral lavage fluid to look at the lower airways. We also look at systemically, and many of the papers that I was discussing before look in the blood that is very different from looking in the lungs or, or in the uh, upper airways. So for reason of time, I will not show you the data that we got in the blood, but just to anticipate it, uh, um, there is no correlation between what we found in the, in the nose or in the lungs to what we found in, in the blood. So let's start from the upper airways. So we used the swab, and initially what we, we asked was, is there any relationship between the viral load and the induction of interference? And so initially we performed a, a qPCR, and in this case what you are seeing are type 3 interference, so interferon lambda 1 and interferon lambda 2 and 3. And lambda 4, uh, we have the data, and you can have a look at the paper. It was published in Cell. Uh, uh, but uh, the level of uh, interferon lambda 4 are very low, and so I'm not presenting the data on interferon lambda 4. So as you can see from uh, this regression red line, there is a very tight correlation between the induction of uh, type 3 interferons and the viral load. At the highest viral load, meaning a lower CT, there is an, uh, an efficient induction of interferon lambda 1 as well as interferon lambda 2. 
This is only partially two for type one interferons. If we look at the interferon beta, uh, there is a, only a weak correlation, while there is no correlation between the viral load and the induction of uh, interferon alpha two. This was done on the entire hundred cohort uh, of patients uh, uh, that we had, but then we wanted to do something different and was to uh, differentiate between uh, subjects that were uh, older or younger than 70 years. And we picked these 70 years because there were many studies that demonstrated that uh, people that were older than 70 years, when exposed to the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 strain, uh, had a much higher probability to, de to develop severe COVID-19. And so we wanted to understand whether this correlation between induction of interference that can work as antivirals and viral load was true across ages or was specific only for an age group. And basically what we found was that uh, this correlation between increased viral load and increased production of interference was true, but was true only for a subject were younger than 70 years. And so in orange, you see the subject that were younger than 70 years. And now you see a very strong correlation, not only for type 3 interference, but also for interferon beta and for interferon alpha 2. While in blue, you see the patients that are older than 70 years. And this correlation between the induction of interference and the viral load is completely lost, or it is significantly decreased compared to subjects that are younger than 70 years. So from this first set of analysis, we concluded that uh, when there is an increased viral load, the immune system probably become capable of sensing the presence of this virus that it was very good at hiding and react by producing interference and in particular type 3 interference. And that this capacity to produce type 3 interference when the virus is growing and the loads of the virus are increasing is more efficient in younger subjects than subjects that are older than 70 years. But what about severity? Of course, the age is a correlation with the severity, but we know that there were also younger subjects that can develop severe COVID-19. And so for a subgroup of our uh, uh, subjects in our cohort, we, we know about their severity because they were either home isolated, that you see here in green, and these are uh, subjects with a mild COVID-19 or they were hospitalized or in ICU. And in this case, of course, it was a severe COVID-19. And now if you look at type 3 interferon, you'll see that the correlation between the viral load and the induction of type 3 interferon is maintained, but it is maintained only for uh, patients with a mild disease. While patients with a severe disease lost this correlation between the induction of interference and the viral load. And it's specifically type 3 interference that characterize in the upper airways these uh, home isolated patients with a mild disease, because this correlation is not true, is not maintained for type 1 interference. So we next really wanted to, to understand the whole landscape of the interference, because what I showed you were qPCR that we did on a limited number of these interferons. And to ask this, we turned to a different technology instead of a qPCR, we perform bulk sequencing uh, that is targeted with the ion uh, torrent technology. And now, as you can see in this slide, we, we are able to cover the entire set of interferons. In pinkish, you have all the dozens type 1 interferons. In blue, you have interferon gamma, so the only member of the type 2 interferon family. And in greenish, you have the three type 3 interferons. And now what you see here is the, the landscape of the production of these interferons. Uh, the, the more yellow is the higher expression, the more blue is the lower expression of these interferons. Uh, these are our control, uh, controls. And now you see the, that we divided our cohort, these this subjects in mild, severe, or critical patients with critical, mild, severe, or critical disease. And I think you can appreciate from this heat map that the landscape of interference is very different in mild, in patients with a mild disease compared to patients with a severe Patients with a mild disease are uniquely characterized by a high expression of three interferons, and in particular, uh, two members of the three interferon family, interferon lambda 1 and lambda 3, and one member only of the type 1 interferon family. While the severe and critical patients produce a lot of type 1 interferons and interferon lambda 2. 
So we wanted to understand whether this landscape of interference was associated with different responses. And as I told you, many ISGs play antiviral roles. And so other groups published over 50 ISGs that they were shown to protect against SARS-CoV-2. And what we found was that in patients with the mild disease characterized by this specific set of interferon, lambda-1, lambda-3, and interferon kappa, show a very efficient induction of many of these anti-SARS-CoV-2 ISGs. In contrast, patients with a severe to critical disease showed a much reduced induction of these anti-SARS-CoV-2 uh, ISGs, although, as you see here, they express a lot of type 1 interference and also interferon like that. So this really showed that different set of interferons may drive different responses and that, that specific interferons can drive very efficient induction of anti-SARS-CoV-2 ISGs. This happens not only in patients with a mild disease, while patients with a severe and critical disease produce different sets of interferons that are not capable of inducing such potent anti-SARS-CoV-2 ISGs. So this was all done using the swabs and thus looking at the upper airways. But what about the lower airways? So this is the landscape of interference that I showed you before in the, in the swabs from, from uh, uh, severe uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. And this is the landscape that we measure in the bronchial vera lavage fluid, again, of severe COVID-19. And as you can appreciate, the landscape is very, very similar. Many type 1 interferon, efficient induction of interferon lambda 2, but absence of interferon lambda 1 and lambda 3. And this was done by, by bulk RNA sequencing, but we also look at the protein level, and we found that in the bronchial viral lavage fluid, there were the production of interferons, but the type 3 interferons uh, uh, were highly... Uh, highly uh, induced at the level of uh, log more than type 1 interference. And then we look at the transcriptional program associated with this landscape of interference, and we found that there was decreased induction of anti-SARS-CoV-2 ISGs compared to the swap of uh, mild of patients with mild COVID-19. And we also found that in these lower airways of, of this uh, severe COVID-19, Patient, there was a profound increase in pro-apoptotic pathway and anti-proliferative -prolifer pathways compared to uh, subjects that were not infected with SARS-CoV-2. And so having a more cell death, more apoptosis, and having less proliferation, of, especially of uh, lung epithelial cells, may be uh, very detrimental because this may delay tissue repair, favoring thus the most severe cases of covid and so these data really suggested, in the, uh, obtained by looking at human samples, that this balance between immune resistance and tissue repair may be completely altered based on the set of interferons that are produced, and that in the severe patients, a lot of interferons are produced in the lower airways and also in the upper airways that are different from the one produced by patients with a mild disease. And this may alter this balance, may delay uh, the tissue repair, uh, uh, favoring apoptosis and decreasing proliferation, and thus may be detrimental. Of course, uh, to determine causality with human samples is always hard, but we really think this is what's happening, and this is based on a set of studies that we perform in mice. In this case, instead of using the virus itself, we mimic a prolonged RNA virus infection, such as SARS-CoV-2, by injecting for six consecutive days every day synthetic viral ligands that mimic the uh, activity of uh, RNA viruses and of SARS-CoV-2. And so we use PolyAC to activate uh, pattern recognition receptor TLR3 and RIGAI that have been shown to respond, to be activated in response to SARS-CoV-2. And we injected another drug, R848, that activate TLR7 and 8, that has also been involved in the responses elicited to SARS-CoV-2. So in this case, we got rid of the virus because we can really ask, are the interference inducing a response to virus encounter playing detrimental roles in tissue restitution when there is this prolonged production of a prolonged encounter with the virus that we mimicked 
by injecting these synthetic viral ligands for six consecutive days. So when mice were injected with saline, nothing happened. When mice were injected we either with R848, that, as I said, target TLR7 and 8, or PolyC, the target TLR3 or Rigai, we found that there was morbidity, so the mice start to lose weight. But when we look at lung permeability, that is a very important parameter because, of, of course, the lung needs to work as a barrier, and so the permeability must be, uh, must be tightly regulated. We found that there was a very significant, significant increase in this permeability, only in mice that were injected with poly-IC, but not with the rate for it. So as, as said, having increased permeability may lead to a lot of problems, may alter the exchange of oxygen, and may also allow the enter of the virus or of other pathogens. And so to test whether the increased permeability may affect uh, really the function of, of, of the immune system in these mice, we injected polycr 848 for the saline control for six days, but at day six, we also super infected with staph virus. So we perform a secondary uh, bacterial, in this case, infection with a sublethal dose of staph virus. As you see here, mice that were treated with saline and were then infected with staph virus perfectly survived. And indeed, this is a sublethal dose of staph virus. The same is true for mice that uh, received the rate for eight for six consecutive days. But mice that received poly-IC and in which I showed there was an increased permeability of their lungs, they all died when they were exposed to this dose of staph aureus. And when we look at uh, uh, bacterial counts in the lungs, indeed we found that there was more bacteria in the lung of these mice treated with poly-IC compared to mice treated with R848 or saline controls. Really so, uh, showing that the increased permeability favored the entrance of this uh, bacteria and this uh, secondary bacterial infection uh, became lethal for the mice. And this is very interesting. This is a, a very nice nature immunology paper that was published by James DeSanto Group. And they showed here in red, you see the critical SARS-CoV-19 uh, patients and in purple, the severe. And these blue bars are uh, uh, stuff blow, uh, blowing. So in these uh, severe and in more, even more in the critical patient, there is a blooming of uh, staph uh, bacteria. And so our data before really suggests that uh, um, the encounter of the, with, the, uh, with the RNA virus uh, may become very detrimental if you are also exposed to staph outbreaks. So we really wanted to understand whether interferons were involved, in, of course, in this increased permeability and susceptibility to staph or infection. And indeed, we found that poly-IC was the only ligand, that, viral ligand that we injected with efficiently induced both type 3 interferons, only lambda 2 and 3 in mice, as I told you before, and type 1 interferons, here represented by interferon beta. And now we look over time, and this, is, this was uh, by RNA, this is the protein, and now you see that uh, by protein, uh, there is a delayed but uh, a prolonged induction of type 3 interference uh, in these mice, in the bronchial viral lavage fluid of these mice, and the level of type 3 interference are logs higher than the level of type 1 interference. And, this, and this really reminds what happened in humans, in which type 3 interference were much highly represented in the lower areas at the protein level compared to type, type 1 interference. So we, in the mouse, though, we can ask whether type 3 interferons are detrimental, and we can do this by using wild-type mice that respond to type 3 interferons that are produced up and, upon policy injection, or to, uh, we can use interferon lambda receptor deficient mice that will not be able to respond to uh, type 3 uh, interferons. And so we injected the policy for six days, and then we superinfected with the Oreos. And as expected, all the wild type mice injected with policy and superinfected died. But now you see that the mice that do not respond to type 3 interference because they are knocked out for the receptor for type 3 interference, even when injected with policy, they all survive to stuff Oreos. And we perform many, many studies, and you can look at this, we publish this in Science. 
uh, and we found that uh, the interference to drive their detrimental role, they are acting on lung epithelial cells. And so we perform bulk RNA sequencing on uh, lung epithelial cells of mice injected uh, with PoIC, either wild type or knockout for the receptor for type 3 interference. And we found that type 3 interference drive pro-apoptotic and P53 pathways, and that they restrict proliferative pathways. And this, again, that we found in mice mirrors what I showed you before in the bronchalveolar lava fluid of severe to critical COVID-19 patients. So from this first set of data, I hope I convinced you that indeed the interference are very potent antivirals. They induce antiviral ISGs, but they also increase apoptosis and decrease proliferation of lung epithelial cells that may work as the factory for the production of the virus. And in this way, they are very potent antiviral. But what I showed you is the dark side of the interference. When they are prolonged for a prolonged period of time, and in particular specific interferons are then produced, the antiviral ISGs are not so efficiently produced anymore, but instead the increased apoptosis and decreased proliferation of the lung epithelial cells delay tissue repair and thus further favor probably viral spread as well as potentially secondary uh, microbial infections. And so this, this we summarized in, in a review that we published in Current Opinion in Virology. And basically what we found, and, and this is supported also by the findings of many other groups, and that specific interference and in we've showed specific interference in the upper airways are antiviral, inducing a very potent intrinsic immunity in lung epithelial cells that decrease the viral load and decrease the severity of COVID-19. But when the virus reaches the lower airways, now interference also uh, participate to the storm, the inflammatory storm that characterizes the most severe cases of COVID-19. And we show that specific interference are produced, it's a very unique landscape, that increase pro pathways and decreases proliferative pathways, thus delaying tissue restitution. And we demonstrated this also in mice. And so overall, uh, from these uh, uh, studies, we concluded that no, it's not only the presence or absence, but really also where they are produced, which interference are produced, and when they are produced, that is fundamental for this balance between immune resistance and tissue repair. And now we'll switch gears a bit. I will always talk about interference, but change and uh, lung virus infection, but starting from a completely different point of view. And so this new story that I'm going to tell you is related to the induction of type 1 and type 2 interference and how we can really harness the power of these interference to create more potent adjuvants that can be used in vaccine formulation to protect against lung virus infections, such as SARS-CoV-2. So this is the work of two very talented people, uh, Francesco Borriello, that now is, uh, is uh, a, a group leader in a, in a, in a, in a biotech, and uh, another postdoc uh, currently, still currently in the lab, that is Valentino Pucci. And so when Francesco started this project, we had a very different question. We were not thinking to lung virus infection. Our major question was, can the physical properties rather than the chemical properties of microbial lichens affect the immune response? And to answer this question, we start working with candida albigans uh, pathogen uh, um, associated molecular patterns. And in particular, we use the two major pumps of candida albigans that are the beta glucans and the men. And why we use this? Because uh, these two have very different physical properties. The glucans are big and uh, particulate. The manans are small and soluble. They signal through two different pattern recognition receptors. Deptin 1 recognizes the beta glucans, Deptin 2 recognizes the manans. But these two pattern recognition receptors converge in their signaling capacity in card dependent, card 9 dependent, and card 9 independent signaling processes that lead to basically identical uh, transcriptional responses. And so this was ideal for us because the physical properties were different, but then the signaling cascade was supposedly very similar. And so we start to inject uh, the, the beta-glucans that, as I 
told you are larger in particulate. And what we found, and we published this in Excel, is that, and this is summarizing a lot of data that are in the, published in this paper. So if you are interested to have a look at the paper, we found that these large and particulate beta glucans induce inflammation in the periphery. And in the most classical uh, view of the activation of the immune system, these uh, uh, phagocytes that are activated in the periphery migrate in the draining lymph node where they can transfer the information of the presence of the pathogen to T and B cells that will be activated, inducing the adaptive immune response. But in, very interestingly to us, we found that the mannas that are small and soluble work in a completely different manner. They do not induce any inflammation in the periphery. They were directly drained to the draining lymph node, where they were uh, capable to uh, activate CD169 subcapsular sinus macrophages that will then uh, regulate the induction of type 1 and type 2 interferons. And these interferons are now fundamental for the expansion, activation of the draining lymph node and, and are fundamental for the activation of T and B responses. And so now we became very interested, uh, based on this, uh, uh, on this data that I briefly summarized, on the possibility that we could change the physical form of this madness to create something that is even more potent uh, uh, by really changing the free physical properties of and so to change the physical properties of the mannans, we let them re spontaneously react with the allom hydroxide through the phosphate group. And this is by mass spec. We found that now 50% of these mannans conjugated with allom, that I will call allom mannan or mannagivant, uh, um, are still soluble, while the other 50% of the mannans are now bound, bound to allom. And so now, if we look in the periphery, I told you that the soluble mannans do not induce any, infl any inflammation. And you see here in orange, there is no induction of chemokine or of inflammatory cytokines, while the beta glucans are very efficient in doing so. But now the alumannan formulation, because some of these mannans are, are now particulate uh, and bound to alum, are able to induce both chemokine and inflammatory cytokines. But the soluble part of our alumannan formulation is directly drained to the draining lymph node that induces uh, interferon induction here represented by GBP2, that is NHG, as much as the soluble mannans do. So this allum mannan formulation now acquired both the capacity to induce some inflammation in, in the periphery and to induce a very potent interferon signature directly in the draining lymph node. And so now we decided to immunize the mice and use this allum mannan formulation as an adjuvant that, we, as I said, we call them. And as an antigen for this uh, uh, immunization that we did with the day prime and boost scheduled at the zero and day 14, we used the prefusion stabilized SARS-CoV-2 spike trimer that, of course, was, uh, was available because we were in the middle of the pandemic. And we, we compared different adjuvants. We used uh, uh, adjuvants that are particulate and induce inflammation in the periphery, such as the alum or the beta glucans. We use the mannas that are only soluble, or we used our new alum mannan formulation, the mannagivant that is in part soluble and in part particulate. We immunize the mice, and then at day 28, we look at the uh, antibody induction against the spike. And now, as so you can see here, S is state for spike, spike plus alum, spike plus beta glucan, spike plus mannan, or spike plus our alum mannan formulation, the mannagivant. Is this formulation, this alumanan formulation that induces the highest amount of anti-spike IgG. And this increased the induction of anti-spike IgG that you see here in red is a spike alum compared to the management plus the spike. This increased induction of anti-spike IgG is completely dependent on type 1 and type 2 interference signaling because we, if we immunize mice that lack the receptor for type 1 or type 2 interference, we completely abrogate the induction, of, the increase the uh, induction of these anti-spike IgGs. It's not only the amount of anti-spike IgGs, but it's also the capacity to neutralize. This is an in vitro neutralization of the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we took the serum from the mice, we added it in vitro on top of, of SARS-CoV-2 and cells that can be infected, and we found a significant increase in the neutralizing capacity of the antibodies 
in the serum of mice that received the alumanan formulation from spike compared to all the other uh, mice that were immunized. So at this point, we start to think that maybe it's not only a matter of quantity, but also of type of, uh, of uh, antibodies that are induced in response to the immunization with the alumanan formulation. And to look at this, we start to collaborate with Steve Allage that created this scan from a drop of blood with the phage display technology. Uh, Steve can determine the epitopes for which the antibodies have been produced against a specific uh, uh, antigen. And so he, 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 he can tell the encounter of several different viruses, but uh, during the pandemic, of course, he, he utilized this technology to look at the different clones of B cells that produce different antibodies for specific linear epitopes, because it's a phage, phage display, it will only detect linear epitopes of the spike protein or SARS-CoV-2. And so here, when you see a darker uh, square, it's because there is a in, it's potent induction of a clone of B cell of an antibody that recognizes a uh, specific uh, 50 or more or less 50 amino acid uh, linear epitope of the spike of SARS-CoV-2. And you can see here that there is a group of mice that has many of these uh, darker squares. And these are the mice from which we took this, the, the blood and the serum that have been immunized with the alumina formulation. And the alumina formulation does expand the repertoire of B cells that recognize specific antigens, epitopes in the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And it's so potent that you will see that we have many of these darker spots also when we use the spike of CoV-1 instead of CoV-2, up to the fact that when we use the spike of MERS that is very different from the spike of CoV-2, we still are still able to detect some uh, 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 antibodies that are able to detect epitopes in the, uh, in the spike of, of MERS instead of in the spike of CoV-2. And this is true only for the alumina formulation. So the alumina formulation is also expanding a lot the repertoire. Now I showed you the neutralization, I showed you the, which uh, epitopes were recognized, but we also actually directly infected the mice. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in this set of experiments, we want to compare uh, the alum that is uh, utilized in humans as an adjuvant, our uh, managuant, our alum and formulation, and two other FDA-approved uh, adjuvants, esqualenoid adjuvants and a TLR4 uh, ligand-based adjuvant is this alum type. And so when we immunize the mice with our 014 schedule, prime, uh, prime boost schedule, we found that uh, alum, mice immunized with alum and spike produce the antibodies much less efficiently than mice that were immunized with the two FDA approved uh, adjuvant, but also with mice immunized with the, uh, our alum manner. And then we infected the mice with the MA10, the mouse adapted the SARS-CoV-2, and we found that while the mice that were immunized, that had been immunized with alum uh, spike were only partially protected, mice that were immunized with the two FDA approved adjuvants or with the alum mannan were all protected against this virus infection. So we were happy with this, but at the time we were doing these experiments, no real variants were still isolated for COVID-2. And we really wanted to push the system a bit more to really understand whether we can spread the repertoire of antibodies in a way that we can protect, cross-protect mice that are immunized with the alumin formulation to uh, different uh, uh, strains of, it, of the same virus. And so to ask this question, we turn to a different virus that has been, of course, used a lot because it has a lot of uh, different uh, uh, types of this virus and uh, subtypes that is influenza virus. And as we all know, the, this virus has many different hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, creating different uh, type of viruses, H1N1, H3N2, and, and so on and so forth. And for each of them, there are multiple uh, hemagglutinin of the type 1, and so on and so forth. So it's a, an ideal virus if one wants to study the, the possibility to expand the protection by expanding the repertoire of B cells that recognize a given. And so we decided again to uh, immunize our mice with prime boost schedule at day 0 and 14, and then look at day 28. But in this case, instead of the spike protein, we used recombinant hemagglutinin. And in particular, we used the flu block of the year of the pandemic 2020. And this is the one that I received in, in my arm 
at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, and uh, they receive every year. And of course, these, uh, the, the components are different every year because every year we encounter different influenza viruses. And that year we used, uh, we used a flu block that contained two uh, hemagglutinin from, from NH1 and 1, NH3 and 2 virus, and two hemagglutinin from influenza B virus. So we immunize the mice, and then we look at the anti uh, hemagglutinin IgG. And the mice were immunized either with only the flu block, so this recombinant hemagglutinin. Uh, the flu block and uh, the alum, the alum mannans, the adjuvant, esqualene oil, FDA approved uh, uh, adjuvant, or the alum father TLR4 uh, uh, agonist uh, like. And again, when we look at the induction of anti uh, uh, hemagglutinin IgG, we found that the most efficient were for the uh, two FDA approved uh, uh, adjuvant and the our man adjuvant. And then what we did was to push the system. So how we did this? We used PR8, that is an influenza virus strain often used in mice. The fact is that the, uh, the PR8 influenza virus does not express the same H1 hemagglutinin that was present in the flu block that we used to immunize the mice. So basically now we are challenging the mice with the virus that uh, express an hemagglutinin that was not utilized as an antigen for the immunization. And we use always the same set of adjuvants that I showed you before. And we look at the effectiveness of the infection with the PR8 by looking at body weight change. And as you see, all the mice were susceptible to the infection with the PR8, with the exception of a group of mice that was resistant, significantly resistant, compared to all the other groups. And this group of mice that resisted to the PR8 infection and the only group are the mice that were initially immunized with the flu block and the management. And why is this? So we hypothesized that because what I showed you for the production of antibodies directed against different spike of different uh, coronaviruses, also in this case, the management, the alumanum formulation may be uh, being able to induce antibodies that cross react with the hemagglutinin of PRA. And this was indeed the case when we measured the antibodies in mice that were not infected before infecting the mice. They were immunized with the, the management and uh, the flu block. They were the only one inducing antibodies that cross-reacted with the hemagglutinin of PR8. None of the other formulation was capable to do this. And this really explained why there was this protection in these mice. And so with this, we, we published this paper in South a few months ago, and we showed that we can really harness the physical properties of microbial ligands. I showed you fungal ligands, but we found similar results also with other uh, bacteria-derived uh, ligands. Everything is in the paper, if you're interested. Induce potent type 1 and type 2 interferon responses that expand the repertoire of antibodies protecting the mice against uh, different strains of a virus. And so with this, I, I really conclude. I want I hope I convince you that interferons are fundamental for their antiviral responses, antimicrobial responses to increase immune resistance, but they, they might be tightly, they have to be tightly regulated because they may alter tissue repair, inducing apoptosis and delaying proliferation. And then we can harness specific the induction of specific interference to create more potent vaccine that can be used against lung virus infections. And with this, I really want to thank all the people, all our collaborators, with which we couldn't do too much of what I showed you, all our funding agencies, all the people in the lab, and in particular, Benedetta, Shreya, Achille, Francesco, and Valentina. And as I said, now Benedetta, Achille, and Francesco are, are, are in the uh, are, uh, lab, the lab. Achille is a PI in Marseille. Uh, Francesco is a group leader at Generate Biomedicine, and Benedetta is now working at Alcimet. And so thank you for your attention. If you are interested in what we do in the lab, please look at our website. If uh, you like uh, interference, but in general, uh, innate immunity, inflammation, uh, follow me on X at Lozanzi. Uh, I, I post all the papers that I found exciting and that answer uh, unknown questions. And with this, I'm happy to take any question and stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Ivan, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just submit a question into that ask a question box located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll answer as many as we have time for. All right, so let's get started. Ivan, my first question for you is, in your human COVID-19 studies, how do you explain in severe patients the presence of specific type 3 and type 1 interferons in the absence of ISG induction? So, yeah, that's, that's uh, this is, uh, is something that uh, we measure. So we know that this is what is happening in these patients. And we are currently looking into how this, is, uh, uh, this happens, how this is achieved. So we have, uh, uh, we already published uh, in our cell paper, when we compared, for example, the three type three interferon, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three, on human lung epithelial cells, we found that they have different capacity to induce specific uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 ISGs. So it is very possible that uh, each interference is signaling in a quite, in a, a different manner and does induce different uh, transcriptional responses, different sets of responses. And this is uh, something that has been discussed a lot for type 1 interferes in the past. The other is is possible explanation that is not mutually exclusive is that there are different cells that produce different types of interference and different cells that respond in different ways. And this is, would be another way to explain why you have certain transcriptional programs that are different when there are specific cells that respond to maybe a different set of interference. And so we are really looking into this both in the human cells and the mouse models to try to better answer these questions. Great, thank you, Ivan. I have another question for you here. This question asks, in the mouse studies, did you identify the source of type three interferons that drive delayed repair and increased excuse me, susceptibility to secondary bacterial infections? Yeah, also this is something we are actively working on, not only in mice, but also uh, in humans to uh, uh, understand which cells produce which type of interference. And so uh, uh, a lot of things are going on, specifically for the mouse studies that we publish in science. Yes, we identified CD11C positive uh, 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 lung uh, uh, resident dendritic cells as a major source of type 3 interference. Um, uh, whether they are the only source is still an open question. We, we have now more data on which we are work, working on that suggest that, uh, and also others showed that before, also epithelial cells can produce interference. PDCs will be capable of producing the interference that are different from CDC1 and CDC2. So it's it's something that is still very open and still very interesting with, uh, for us and we are actively working on it. Great, thank you. This next question asks, in the vaccine study, do you have any idea on how the man adjuvant is increasing the repertoire of antibodies produced against the given antigen? Yeah, so we know that type one and type two interference are necessary. Uh, is that exactly uh, the mechanism behind uh, this is something that we are actively again investigating and uh, I can anticipate that yes we think that uh, uh, the duration of the response in the draining lymph node is increased uh, upon encounter with the, this uh, management and so we are really looking at the terminal center and the possibility that uh, these remain for a prolonged period of time, as well as, of course, the somatic, somatic uh, changes in somatic permutation. And we really want to understand the molecular mechanism that drive this uh, increased uh, repertoire of antibodies. Great, thank you. Another question here, where is the spike only control in the man adjuvant experience, or excuse me, experiment? So we, we, we have also maybe went a bit fast. Uh, there were a lot of data on my slides, but uh, uh, we also immunize the mice always as, as a control with the spike only. And the spike only in the absence of any adjuvants give a very, very weak response. There is no neutralization basically of the virus, but this is really what is expected because you need inflammation to, to have uh, the the immune mediators that will be able to then 
uh, activate uh, uh, T cells and B cells against a specific antigen. So there is a control for all the experiments and the cell paper here. They, they can go and, and check, check it. Perfect. Great, thank you. And for the sake of time, since we are running a bit short, we'll go ahead and wrap up after this final question here. So this question asks, how can I protect myself from the corona infection if the infection spreads strongly this year? So the best way is to get vaccinated. This is, uh, of course, a very, uh, we know that the vaccine works very well. Uh, of course, the new variants are challenging uh, the, the current vaccine. But uh, it has also been shown that uh, 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 repetitive uh, immunization really helps to increase the level of the antibodies, and this will give some protection. Remember that you, many of us are not naive anymore to the virus. Everything I showed, as I said in my presentation, was when nobody was exposed to the virus. Nowadays, this situation is very, very, uh, unlikely because it's either through the vaccination or through an encounter with the virus that uh, um, that uh, uh, we have been experienced. So we are not naive anymore and our immune system know what is facing. Of course, the variants change a lot and so they are trying to escape what the protection that we have. This doesn't mean that uh, the severity of the disease is as high as it was during the first week. So said, of course, there are also the masking could be another possibility. This is really left to the sensitivity of each of us. But when traveling on an airplane, on an enclosed uh, space, or in a crowded room, one can think if there are uh, such good reasons not to become positive, because there are multiple conditions that, for which uh, SARS-CoV-2 is still very, very dangerous. So this is another possibility. Wonderful. Well, Ivan, thank you again so much for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand for two years until September 7th, 2025. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So until next time, take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.